fa fancy getting the graveyard shift. I will keep this to the point and uh, fairly rapid. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to present again. The rare earths industry is indeed a diversified and intriguing one, and I'm very happy to be back in the rare, and rare earths industry where I've been involved now for 20 odd years in some capacity or another. There is a reason why um, I've chosen to come back into the rare earths industry in northern minerals. It's because I think this is one of the most fascinating opportunities in the sector at the moment. Uh, and I think this company, we've kept a fairly sharp eye on keeping simple the story and keeping ourselves pointing heavily towards our future production. Let me give you quickly some of the executive highlights, or if you like, the investment highlights. Boom. Let's see. This is working. Yep. No? The green? Green arrow. Green arrow. Got it. Disclosures. We got all those. Before I do, I just want to actually acknowledge the Jaru people of the country on which we will build this operation. It is really a critical element of everybody's involvement in the mining industry that we do work with local community in a very close and meaningful way and we're very happy to have a very strong relationship and I didn't want to let the opportunity pass without mentioning Jaru people's uh, in partnership with us. The highlight points. Essentially, we want to be in the near term, the leading non-China supplier of this metal that nobody's really ever heard of called dysprosium, shortened to DY, much easier, uh, and terbium, which are very, very important in the future of the magnet industry. Magnets are vital. I'm essentially battery technology stores energy. Magnet converts that en energy into kinetic energy and allows the propulsion systems to work and they're just as important, if not in many ways more critical, than the storage elements of it. I think the market is now focusing, people are now focusing on these elements, uh, and so we want to be the leading supplier. When I say leading supplier, it's a small market. I'll come back to it. It's about 2,000 tonne a year. We are going to be producing about 400 to 500 tonnes a year of dysprosium, so a significant part of the market. Um, we've de-risked this project substantially in a very important partnership that we have with um, with Iluca Minerals. Iluca is building a $1.5 billion uh, rare earth separation plant at Eniaba in Western Australia. It's the second plant uh, outside of China of that size, one I know very well, called Linus, uh, which I was very heavily involved with early on. And this is the second non-China substantial uh, rare earth separation plant. Um, second time around, um, we've simplified this and uh, decided that the best thing that, that Northern Minerals could do is stay being a miner and not go down into the chemical end of the industry. Been there, done that. It is very, very complicated. Uh, and we're very happy that we're able to produce a concentrate at Brown's Range and then go and sell that directly to the front gate of Iluca. Uh, and I'll explain the terms on which we get that. We think we're very happy with those as well. Um, the mine has been well established uh, at, for a long time, not as an operating mine uh, at scale, but as a pilot plant. We've had a pilot plant there for three years, and that gives us a very large element of de-risking the production process uh, on, on the way through. The flow sheet is well developed, uh, and really it's a matter of getting this thing into production. It is in a region, district, province, whatever you want to call it, um, that is very exciting for potential further rare earth discovery. We, it has been drilled out. There's been over 150,000 metres of drilling over 10 years at, uh, at Brown's Range, uh, and it's shown very significant occurrences of mineralisation uh, that are for the future in, in a big way. But our key primary focus today as a company is get the mine built and start getting into the system with cash flow and uh, an operating entity. That has been the focus. Well, that has been the focus of our strategic review since I took uh, the chairmanship of the company about 18 months ago, uh, and we are now effectively ready to move into that. Uh, the company was founded as a uranium exploration company. Instead of finding uranium, as often happens, it found rare earths, which are associated, uh, and has been for 10 years developing that rare earths uh, deposit and system.
We'll come back to where we are. This is an illustration of the pilot plant that was running up there. This is not the production unit we will have, but it has produced well over 1,000 tonnes of rare earth concentrate over three years and therefore does give us a very high level of confidence in terms of the ability to process this material and produce a commercial product for sale. The proposition is that in this high quality mineral field that I've talked about, we have found the starter mine. We will build the Browns Range plant. We believe that the Wolverine mine, as we've called it, which is a open pit underground uh, development, which we will be doing uh, starting next year, is the first of potentially many in the region. The mineralisation structures on this granite dome uh, are well understood. Uh, and we have de-emphasised further exploration work for the purposes of de dedicating our funding towards early development, but we will go back to this rich geological system, uh, which is quite unique as an underground expression or a deep expression, primary expression, if you want to put it that way, of the D dysprosium and terbium mineral called xenotime, which usually is better known for its occurrence in ionic clays but obviously it's a much higher grade material when you get it in deep primary form. Um, we think, as far as we know, this is the only hard rock mine uh, that we know of which is economically heavily exposed to dysprosium and terbium over and above any other element. So it's a pure play, not in rare earths, but in a very specific rare earths element. That is because the distribution of xenotime is rich in dysprosium and terbium. Um, we have about 10% effectively terbium and uh, dysprosium. They go together. Um, I'll come back to the application. I think Trevor talked a little bit about the applications of these heavy rare earths and the supply chain. Um, but uh, that is 80 or 75% of our economic value. The other rare earths are interesting, some of them not payable, but you'll note that, for example, in NDPR, neodymium presidimium, which drive Linus, which drive all the larger uh, rare earth operations because of their use in the magnet market, we're actually quite light. We're only 3.2% 3, 3 of neodymium. Um, so this is really about a very specialty metal. We're moving towards production. Um, we have uh, an operation, have had an operation up there with 50 or 60 people during the pilot plant. We've mothballed that for now and we're doing a DFS uh, based on some earlier DFS work that was done in 2015. We expect the DFS to be complete in October, um, and then we are looking for uh, FID in early 2024, first Q1 2024. Production is forecast to align with the opening of the Iluka plant in 2026, uh, where we will be feeding about 20% of Iluka's throughput capacity will come from this mine. The supply agreement with Iluca is strategically valuable to us because it actually takes away both CapEx obligation to our shareholders with its very dilutive effect and uh, price uh, and marketing risk uh, on the way through. Um, the agreement is one which allows both parties to benefit. Iluca obviously need to get some benefit of the oxide price that we don't get in order to get back some of the one a return on the one and a half billion dollars they're spending building that part of the plant. Uh, we, on the other hand, don't have to spend the money on that. We also simplify massively our operational requirements, uh, and that is valuable for us as, uh, on, on the way through as well. I'll come back to the the uh, Iluka transaction because it's a very important part of the value in this company and the creation of value in this company. The processing plant is simple. The pilot plant did try and produce, well, did produce carbonate uh, up at Browns Range, which is up in the Kimberleys and a long way from anywhere. Um, we've simplified that and said we're going to cut the carbonate out, and that's why we're selling the concentrate directly to our Luca. So it really comes down to a known and fairly, fairly straightforward process of run of mine ore, crushing, magsep, float, concentration uh, through that float, uh, float producing about 25% cons uh, and we'll be feeding about 
20,000 tonnes a year to the Iluka plant of that 25 per cent cons, taking it by road from the Kimberleys down to any ABBA. Um, it's a high value product. The actual road transportation is not a particular barrier to anything. We um, have existing non-process infrastructure, ranging from airstrips to camps up there, um, and we're going to leverage off that to get going quickly. The demand for terbium and dysprosium is really linked entirely to the evolution of use of high intensity magnets for the EV market and things like the uh, offshore wind turbine or the wind turbine magnet uh, market generally. Permanent magnets have been around a long time. Room temperature permanent magnet activity is fine. You can actually find lots of uses that use permanent magnets at around about room temperature. The problem statement is simply that if you are using permanent magnets, near the ion boron permanent magnets in a high temperature environment, that is anything over about 50 to 60 degrees C, which is the usual operating environment for uh, a electric vehicle or a wind turbine, uh, it, the material will demagnetize and lose its use uh, unless it is blended with about 5% of dysprosium or terbium. It's, and I use 5% very generically, it depends on the particular magnet, what the particular blend would be. It is, in some senses, the unknown secret source of the magnet industry. Um, and it's that gap in production of dysprosium that actually stops there being a really valid, independent supply chain for magnets outside of China. Deodymium and presidymium exist. Uh, terbium and dysprosium do not exist in production capacity sufficiently to blend the amount of uh, neodymium and presidymium in the proportion required to make permanent magnets. So this is essential. I just want to say that one of the things that is important about the Iluka plant is that with our material, the other side of that plant will come out oxides that are the only place outside of China where you will be able to get access to the proportionate blend of these heavy rare earths and light rare earths to be able to make high intensity magnets for these applications. So we think that's got a very important uh, strategic uh, positioning. China, as we know, is responsible for 90 per cent um, and a, a lot of the DYTB is coming from Myanmar. Two minutes and we're all over. The Aluka Strategic Partnership, quickly, it is not just a supply agreement. They have, quote them, wanted to make us bankable. They've given us a fixed price contract, which is adequate for us to be able to operate and upside associated with the oxide price. I won't go into the detail. They've also put $20 million in the company through convertible note and equity placement to help us get to FID, and they have committed to taking $50 million of equity at FID. It'll be in total about a $400 million project, $250 million we expect to debt, $50 million equity from Iluca. It makes it a very bankable proposition. It benefits both parties. As I've discussed, we're a big part of their plant um, and, and their planning, and uh, we have a great respect for their technical ability to build that operation, uh, and uh, are very pleased to be in close partnership with them on the any ever refinery. This just illustrates the fact that we do get exposure above a certain price to the oxide prices, so our shareholders are not losing the upside of the scarcity in dysprosium. We think there will be a bigger deficit in dysprosium and terbium in, in 2000, and call it 35 or 30, depending on the numbers, than just about any other of the battery minerals, magnets, EV space minerals. Uh, numbers are sort of 2,000 tonnes of production now. We expect demand to move towards five to 6,000 tonnes by then per annum, uh, and it's very difficult to see the sources. So really, that's the proposition for the company. It's a very boutique, fairly simple uh, story to understand. We're moving, uh, uh, we're going to produce a very unique product into a structural deficit, uh, which is essential to be plugged in order to get the electrification process underway. We're excited to be involved in it. We've got a good management team doing that. Uh, and uh, we look forward to production 2026. Thank you.